Good afternoon. Hi. Thanks so much for coming here today. Um, so the topic of, our, of what we're here to brief you about is two very exciting missions that are going to be launched next year by NASA. Um, this is quite unusual, having two um, missions launched uh, in the same year, um, and they're complementary and they're to study very similar processes, um, all parts of the water cycle. So we're here to kind of put that into context, put the science questions that we're trying to answer um, into the big picture context for you, and then go into some details about the measurements and what we might learn from these missions, uh, so that you're all ready for these exciting stories that we're bound to provide you over the next uh, few years as these missions um, fly. So just um, concentrating on the polar regions for now, because that's uh, my expertise, I'm here to tell you about um, the polar regions. So um, there's two separate uh, things that are going on in the poles. Um, the first one is on the left, and that is the sea ice cover. And mainly um, the Arctic is where we're concerned. The sea ice cover is shrinking. Um, and then on the right, we have land ice, which is also shrinking um, in both hemispheres, in, in both poles. Uh, there's two ice sheets, one in the south, uh, the southern hemisphere, the Antarctic, and one in the northern hemisphere, Greenland. Um, and both of those ice sheets are losing mass to the ocean. Um, so why do we care about this, and why is this going to have an impact? Um, so there's two different reasons. Uh, for the sea ice, it's actually um, to do with the changing area of the sea ice. So um, sea ice is very uh, white and bright, highly reflective. Um, most of the solar energy that's incident on the sea ice will be reflected back to space. Um, so it acts like a shield. Um, so as you change the area of that shield, you're going to reduce how much energy uh, gets reflected back, and you replace that bright white surface with, high, with absorbing dark ocean surface, and you're going to get this feedback, which we call the ice albedo feedback, which is going to exacerbate um, climate change. We also uh, are going to experience changes in um, ocean uh, insulation because sea ice is actually insulating bit non-intuitive, but actually ice insulates uh, the exchange of energy from the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, and we're going to change the bottom water formation, because as sea ice forms, we get dense water uh, falling to the base of the ocean floor and uh, becoming part of the ocean circulation. The other one is increased accessibility of the Arctic Ocean, which is more a policy um, impact, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, soon. So um, the land ice has a different consequence. Um, because sea ice, when it melts, does not change sea level at all because it's already floating. But the land ice um, is sitting on top of the continents, and as the land ice melts, it adds mass to the ocean. The only place for that mass to go is for the ocean to rise. Um, so there's two impacts of melting land ice, the first one being sea level rise, and the second one being that the oceans actually freshen because that fresh water comes off the ice that melts. Um, and goes into the uh, oceans. Um, and in both ice sheets, we see that the land ice is shrinking. So this is how uh, sea level rise works. This is the Earth's water cycle. You'll see this throughout uh, these presentations. Um, and the sea level components, basically there's two components um, that are adding or contributing to sea level rise. The first one is thermal expansion. Most of the energy that's, um, that's, um, that the Earth is, is um, is, is the, the increased energy because of climate change in the Earth system is in the oceans and it's coming in, going to the deep oceans and as the water um, heats up it actually expands and takes up more space so the sea level rises. That's called thermal expansion. The other um, component is melting land ice and this is this, the, um, the one that, um, that the ice sheets are contributing to, uh, to sea level rise, ice sheets and uh, mountain glaciers. So just a schematic to show you how the ice sheets contribute to sea level rise. Um, this is um, just a, a slice through the Antarctic um, ice sheet um, where it goes off into an ice shelf. And what we have is the ice sheet grows through, um, it gains mass or snow falls on it and turns into ice and that's how the ice sheet grows. But it also loses mass. Um, over a uh, period of time, we have to monitor these inputs and outputs. So the difference between the green and the red terms is going to tell us whether the ice sheet is growing or shrinking. Um, so surface melting, basal melting, and iceberg carving are the processes that we lose mass from. Um, so that if the red terms become larger than the green terms, then we are going to see um, the sea level is going to rise. 
And the reason why that's so concerning, um, Antarctica and Greenland, the total reservoir of um, ice in those, um, in those ice sheets is about 210 feet. Um, there's much more in Antarctica than in Greenland. Um, it's about seven or eight meters, uh, 20 feet or so in Greenland, and the rest is in Antarctica. Um, so we have a very large potential sea level rise from those ice sheets, and that's what we're going to monitor with these two uh, satellites. Um, this is a plot that shows a time series starting in uh, 2005. So um, this, is, this is capturing most of the last, uh, the GRACE mission. Um, the black line is the rate of sea level rise measured by a different set of uh, satellites. This is a Topex Poseidon. Um, this is about three millimeters per year on average. Um, and then the red component is the melting land ice and the blue is the thermal expansion. And you can see around about 2007, 2008, the melting land ice became larger than the thermal expansion um, component, which means that the melting land ice signal is actually dominating the sea level rise um, budget. And so this is a concern. We do see evidence of accelerating mass loss from both ice sheets, from Greenland and Antarctica, and we need to keep monitoring them um, to see how that is going to change in the future. Um, this is um, a study that's showing the uh, accelerating mass loss from the ice shelves, or the volume loss from the ice shelves, um, over a time period of 18 years. And the reason I put this up is to show you what would happen if we just monitored for about four or five years. Um, so this time series at the bottom, it doesn't really, it's, a, it's 18 years, that, um, that whole uh, time span there, um, the plot. And then this is about four years. This is another four years, and this is another four years. So you can see, depending on when you launch your satellite, if you're only going to observe for, for three or four years, you're going to get a very different result. So this is our need, this is, this is just um, to, to highlight the need for these continuous measurements. We can't just look for a short time and think we know the answer. We need to have continuous missions that monitor over long time periods so we can really understand what this, um, this mass, loss, mass loss signature is. The other thing that's important is it's not just about the line and the gradient of the line. It's also about the wiggles that in between that line. We need to really know about the processes that are driving the changes on the ice sheets um, and the detail in between is actually very interesting because we can start to learn about the atmospheric and ocean processes that are driving the mass loss. Um, so that's why these um, instruments are so important because we can get a handle on that, um, that sort of time scale. Um, so with that, I'm going to move to Don, who's going to talk about the, um, the hydrology system. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. <clears throat> so Helen uh, talked about the ice sheets and the uh, uh, glaciers and ice caps and their relationship uh, to sea level and the Earth's water cycle. But I'm going to talk about a few other uh, portions of the Earth's water cycle and how we can measure them uh, with uh, satellite gravity and why they're important. So uh, a couple of these uh, are groundwater storage. Uh, and this is important because a lot of places in the world, that's where we extract our water from for us, uh, to civilization, our cities, and also for irrigation. Uh, and also um, surface water. Um, and both of those can have an influence on sea level rise if we are extracting groundwater and it's evaporating, goes into precipitation, it'll run off more and go into the ocean and, and raise sea level or if we're holding water back uh, from running off through building dams, and that can actually cause a, a sea level uh, drop. And just to show you how large this uh, <clears throat> signal can be, this is a natural climate variation that occurred in 2011. Uh, and so in the figure on the right, you can see uh, two estimates of the uh, sea level. One is the ocean mass component only that Helen talked about, and one is the total sea level that you measure by uh, satellite altimetry. And in 2011, you can see that sea level dropped by about seven millimeters and stayed low for a considerable amount of time. Uh, the reason for that is because the water was taken out of the ocean and put on land, but it had to stay on land. And the reason for that is because of uh, extraordinary rainfall in uh, Australia that happened in late 2010 and into 2011. There were uh, 
several different climate systems that kind of converged on Australia at that time where they had excess rainfall coming in from the east, from the west, and from the south, and it dumped uh, torrential rains on the center of Australia, actually formed a shallow inland sea. And because in that area there was no way for water to run off back into the ocean, it just sat there until it could evaporate. And so that took a long time. But you can see, although it's a small change in sea level, it's measurable and it's thousands of gigatons of water that contributed to that. <clears throat> oh. uh, another example uh, showing uh, depletion and changes in groundwater storage for the Central Valley in California where a lot of crops are irrigated. Um, the figure on the right is showing the map of sea level change of uh, ocean mass or water storage changes where reds are depletions and blues are gains. And then the time series is showing uh, how it's evolving over time. And so you can see from about 2010 to 2014, this large change in water storage, drop in water storage as the aquifer was being pumped to sustain water during the drought of California during that time. And although it's gone back to near normal stages of uh, water extraction, uh, as we can see from the wildfires that are happening now in California, this past history of the drought is still affecting California, and this is likely to continue to have water withdrawn in the future during uh, drought conditions in California. And so it's important that we have uh, <clears throat> continued uh, observations of this, not only in California, but in many areas of the world, we actually have no good measurements of groundwater how much water is there and how much water is being pumped out of it. Uh, another thing that uh, satellite gravity can be used for is to determine ocean bottom uh, currents. Now, this isn't a direct measurement of the, of the system. Uh, we can use pressure gradients from the ocean mass changes that we measure from, from grays to derive the bottom currents. Uh, we can't do this near the equator because the relationship that we use uh, breaks down there. But for the rest of the ocean, we can determine uh, ocean bottom currents and see how they're varying in time. And now th this is uh, important because there really is no other global measurement of bottom currents. And several of these systems have important climatic effects uh, on the planet and uh, for the ocean itself. Uh, one of these is the Atlantic Meridional Returning Circulation. Uh, this uh, large scale current system uh, is responsible for transporting heat in the Atlantic, uh, from the South Atlantic toward the pole. That heat is released uh, into the atmosphere and keeps us uh, temperate in uh, uh, North America and Europe. And this is just an example showing the bottom currents off the coast of uh, uh, North America there, that line of uh, reds. And greens there showing high bottom currents. That's associated with the return current as this current moves north, it sinks, and then it returns at depth. And this is just an example uh, showing the variability in that bottom current uh, that can be measured by grace. Another example is in the Southern Ocean. Uh, it's not as coherent a current as the deep AMOC. Uh, but all these various filaments of uh, variability in the Southern Ocean uh, contribute to the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. And so from the gravity measurements, we can measure the interannual variability of this current system and see how it's varying in time. And it's very difficult to do this with any other measurement other than GRACE because though we have to rely uh, on in situ measurements that are sparse and only observe occasionally. Whereas with GRACE and future gravity missions, we can actually continue this for, for a long term and see how it's varying. And I think with that, it's time for uh, Torsten to talk about ISAT 2. Hi. Uh, hi, thank you for having me. Um, both previous speakers, by the way, are newly elected uh, fellows of AGU. So. You know, it's great if those people like of that stature are excited about our mission. That's a good thing. Um, so, I said too. Um, Helen talked about you know the, the, the changes that are going on uh, in the um, 
cryosphere in, uh, for the last couple of decades. And that's, that's the reason why in the last decadal survey, um, you know, a recommendation was made to NASA, continue the, um, you know, the altimetry measurement that just started with ISAT-1. ISAT-2 is a laser altimeter. The concept is trivial. We sent small laser pulses down to the Earth, measures the time it takes for the laser pulse to bounce off the Earth, get back to the um, satellite, and we convert time into range and range into elevation, and we are there. The detail is very, very complex because laser uh, light travels very, very, very fast. Um, the formulating emission is a very formal process, and formulating development designing emissions is a very form formal process. And we work together with the science definition team, and Helen was or is on the science definition team, to come up with science objectives, formal statements that we need to, you know, um, achieve with a mission to make it a success. And so for ISA 2, we have four um, science objectives, two for, CI, uh, two for the ice sheets. The first one is quantify the polar um, ice sheet contributions to sea level change. You're still trying to get the light off? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> it's all good. I just continue. Um, Okay, um, <laughs> so measuring basically elevation changes of the entire ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, that was the sole objective I said one had that was launched in 2003. We learned a lot and the scientists learned a lot from I said one and at the bottom you see elevation change for Antarctica and for Greenland and you know the areas where we see the most drastic changes, you know where you have these deep purple and deep red, uh, you know, the outlet glaciers around the, the margins of the continent. This is where the action is. The action is the sloped, you know, glaciers, etc. And the science team was very clear about it that we need to do better than what ISAT-1 was able to do. We need to be able to quantify the regional signatures of ice sheet uh, changes. And the emphasis here is on, on regional signatures. This is where we need to do better than what ISAT-1 was able to. And this is something we need to, to, uh, to accomplish with ISAT-2. Um, sea ice, you know, the, the goal, the objective is very simple, measure sea ice thickness. We have a good handle on sea ice area from satellite images for the last 30 plus years. And, you know, you all have seen a picture like there in the middle that, you know, that shows that the Arctic sea ice is, you know, dramatically decreasing in area. Um, what we don't know, what we didn't know since ISAT-1 was, is it actually thinning? or what's, what's going on with the thickness. The third dimension has always been the missing piece, and for the uh, five years for which we have ISAT-1 data, you know, as shown at the bottom, you know, overall, you know, uh, the thickness has decreased by over two feet. Just for your geographic orientation, at the bottom there's, uh, right there's Greenland, you know, and on the, uh, uh, to the left is the Canadian archipelago, and at the top there's Russia. Um, we also have a fourth uh, science objective which says, I know, that's getting hard to read for you guys, right? Uh, measure vegetation canopy height as a basis for reducing our errors in the global carbon budget. And, you know, the plot shows that the largest uncertainties in our global carbon budget are in the terrestrial components. So we're trying to measure canopy height to reduce those errors, or uncertainties, I should say. Um, I said, too, it's a global mission, you know, to pull our orbit, so we measure everywhere on Earth. So we also have additional operational products that are land elevation. We me measure land elevation and land elevation change everywhere. We measure atmospheric profiles at the, at the bottom right. You know, there's a typical atmospheric profile, you know, collected from our airborne, ISAT-2 airborne simulator. And you can see these different, you know, types of clouds and aerosols, pen planetary boundary layer clouds we can detect as well. And you see a thin line at the bottom, which is the surface. And, you know, of course, if you have very thick cloud cover, we, don't, we are not able to see the surface anymore with our laser. So, in order to measure, uh, to meet all those, you know, science objectives, we designed a mission, which is, you know, a multi-beam micropulse laser at 532 uh, nanometers, which is in the green, so actually if you stand underneath, underneath the laser, you will be able to see the green light coming down. And we have single photon uh, 
multiplier tubes as detectors um, on the spacecraft. The beam geometry is a three by two pattern and we slightly, very slightly, yaw the spacecraft so that, the, that we have an arrangement of you know, three pairs of beams. The pairs of beams are essential for accomplishing our second science requirement, which means measure elevation change over the sloped areas and glaciers, because this allows us to extract the cross-track slope from ISAT uh, uh, 2. What will the data look like? As I said, you know, we are having photo multiplier tubes in space. And so rather than measuring you know, energy or anything like this, we count in, in time individual photons. So individual pings of, uh, um, we, we detect on time all of those. And here are three examples of for ice sheets, sea ice, and vegetation. You know, you see overall, you see some you know, random distribution of, of, of dots here, which is just, you know, photons from the sunlight coming in at random spaces uh, and at a random frequency. And then we see, but clearly we can also see you know, where the surface is, where we have a greater density of photons. And if we calculate a histogram for the photons, in this case, between the two uh, vertical red lines, you, know, you see the histogram on the right side. And you, you can clearly you know, calculate the, uh, or extract the surface elevation from you know, this photon cloud. And depending on, on, on conditions, depending on our precision requirements, and dep depending on, on signal-to-noise ratios, we may vary the, the distance between the two um, vertical red lines, which means you know, we can you know, even get higher and higher resolution or lower resolution, depending on what you're, we're after. CS is a little different. With laser altimetry, we are not able to directly measure CI thickness. So the way we measure it, we measure the height of you know, these small opening, we call leads and pollinators. Um, and in this picture here, in the photon cloud over here, it's you know, the area where we have the two green vertical lines. And we calculate the histogram of these, you know, between these two green vertical lines and you know, plot it on, on the right side. And then we also calculate the histogram over the sea ice, which is you know, between the, the uh, two red lines. And you can see this, these two histograms, and you know, they are different in height, you know, because the difference is how much ice is sticking is above sea level. And if we know the densities of the ice, the water, the snow, etc., we can convert you know, the freeboard um, to sea ice thickness. And this is how we measure sea ice thickness from space. Vegetation, you know, in this case, it's, it's more noisy, so we have a noisier uh, background. But you can also see at the bottom um, right, you know, you see the diffuse return distribution for the crown of the tree, and then you see a, a, a clearer spike um, for the surface, and this allows, you know, vegetation scientists to extract tree height, maybe even tree, you know, uh, a, a type, depending on, you know, a function of structure. In, in addition to meeting our, you know, science objectives that we as a scientist, you know, need to, are interested in, there's a whole group of people who are interested in ISA 2 data um, that are not, you know, directly scientists. You know, Helen talked about the shrinking sea ice. So we have lots of people are interested in sea ice thickness, more than I actually was aware of. You know, Arctic shipping companies are interested in, in the sea ice thickness. The U.S. Coast Guard is interested in getting data. We had a meeting with uh, applied uh, an applied sciences meeting where marine insurance companies, you know, Lloyds from London attended to, to you know, get a handle of, you know, see, I think it's information for the insurance purposes. And then, you know, we monitor coastal erosion, you know, the states of Alaska, Florida are very interested in, 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 in this type of data. Lake and river water stages, we can measure flooding. Permafrost monitoring near coastal bathymetry because our laser penetrates fresh and clear light to some extent. And of course, land management. Uh, groups are interested in our data. So just to sum it up and, 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 and to illustrate you know, the, the technological accomplishment of ISAT 2. So while you guys blink, which is you know, roughly half a second, you know, we sent 5,000 laser shots down to Earth, which is you know, it's very, very fast, 5,000 shots a half a second. Um, do this with your cameras. And, and, and so we split this into six beams. You know, we take 30,000 measurements. You know, over high reflectivity targets, we get roughly, you know, for every shot, we get, you know, 10 photons or so back. So within half a second, we time 300,000 photons with a precision 
of a picosecond, because light is very, very fast, we need to measure it extremely accurate. Actually, we, we need to measure it so accurately that clocks don't exist right now to measure that accurately. So we had to build our own clock. And, you know, we cover a distance of, of two miles and take a measurement every two and a half feet, or se more accurately, 70 centimeters, which is very, very densely spaced. And, you know, we do all this while you blink. Thanks so much. Uh, and next up is Felix for Grace. Well, thank you, Torsten, and thank you all for coming. Um, so as uh, the deputy project scientist for Grace Fall On, it's my pleasure to um, provide you an update on the mission, Grace Follow On, and uh, um, uh, provide a little more detail on how we use Grace Follow On to track Earth's surface mass changes and water cycle. Uh, while this is a NASA briefing, uh, I want to highlight here that Grace Follow On is a collaboration between NASA and our German partners, the German Research Center for Earth Science, GFZ, with uh, support from the German Space Agency, DLR. GRACE is an acronym, stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. And as the name Follow On suggests, uh, it comes on the heels of the very successful GRACE, first GRACE mission, the original GRACE mission, which was launched in 2002 and was operational until just recently, when uh, due to age, we unfortunately had to end operations. But over its 15 years in space, uh, GRACE really um, provided uh, an unprecedented insight on how uh, components in the Earth system are changing, in particular how uh, water is being transported uh, through our water cycle, uh, from ice sheets, through sea level, through land, as you saw in the presentations from my colleagues uh, Helen and Don. Uh, GRACE really was the first mission that enabled us to place accurate number on these mass changes. And um, due to its unique measurement concept, which, will I, uh, which I will uh, elaborate uh, briefly in a second, GRACE and, and GRACE follow on don't really care about the shape, form, or even uh, whether the water is visible. Um, we detect it through gravity. And in that way, uh, the GRACE and GRACE follow on measurements are really uh, extending into all the realms of Earth science, whether you're an ice sheet person or a sea level person. Um, the GRACE data has something for you. Um, you know, we can track the ice sheets, the mass changes in particular. We can uh, see how it changes sea level. Um, we can see the groundwater depletion that you saw in this animation from, from Don and uh, this this picture here that you can see. Unfortunately, it's a somewhat weak contrast, but uh, this is a global picture of, and it depicts aquifers. So this, these are deep groundwater reservoirs that are used for uh, irrigation, for consumptions, consumption of water. And uh, in the yellow and red t colors, you see those aquifers that are being depleted at a faster rate than they're being replenished. So this is, you know, these, these rates of with withdrawal in the long term are unsustainable. And in particular, if you look at northern India, that's, that's deep, dark red. That, that is one of the most heavily irrigated regions in the world. Uh, a lot of people depend on the food crops that are grown there. And GRACE has enabled us to really literally weigh the mass change in the aquifers. Um, GRACE also has something for solid earth scientists because we can detect large earthquakes and how they affect uh, um, the gravity field. There's something to be learned there. Uh, Don highlighted how we can use GRACE to measure deep ocean currents. So we can literally peak from space to, to the seafloor, to the bottom of the ocean. And just testament to that wide range of applicability are the uh, large number of publications, uh, over 4,300 and growing uh, over the last 15 years. So the prime mission objective of GRACE follow on is to continue that uh, measurement and that cap uh, pr continue to provide that capability uh, for Earth science. And um, I just want to briefly explain in somewhat more detail on how we actually make these measurements. Uh, I mentioned the unique measurement concept. So here you see an animation of uh, the GRACE satellites. So in case you hadn't seen it, or GRACE follow-on satellites are two satellites. So they're a pair. They operate in tandem. They orbit the Earth. And they track each other. So they're following each other uh, fairly closely at an altitude of about 500 kilometers. Uh, in, in real life, they're a little bit further apart than is depicted here, about uh, 130 miles, 220 kilometers. 
And uh, the range, though, is not constant in time. It changes, as you can see here. They do this, what we call this dance. And uh, they're not tethered. What's drawn there is a, an electromagnetic signal. Uh, in the case of Grace Fall On, our primary instrument is a microwave ranging instrument. So what we do is we constantly uh, assess the distance variation between the satellites. And in that way, you can think of the two satellites as kind of two probes in orbit. So the satellites themselves are the experiment. Uh, you saw an ISAT, we're using a laser to, to reflect off the surface of the Earth. We don't do any such thing with GRACE. Our, our measurement is between the satellites. And the, the range variation that you saw here uh, is actually greatly exaggerated. The signal that we're interested in is on the length scale of a few micrometers. That's the thickness of a human hair. So that's how sensitive this measurement is. Um, Grace Fallon will have a uh, laser technology demonstration instrument, the, the so-called laser ranging interferometer, LRI. That's the first in space. So uh, instead of a microwave system, which this will also have as the primary instrument, oh, great contrast, come back. Uh, uh, Grace Fallon will have a, a laser, and that enables us to do this ranging at, uh, with a, just a, a much higher accuracy, factor 10 to 20. So we've gone from sort of human hair thickness scale uh, down to a scale of large viruses. So this is a few dozen uh, uh, nanometers, so it's quite impressive. And uh, I should mention also that this laser technology uh, can be applied to other uh, uh, NASA missions, uh, for example, astrophysics, if you think of uh, LISA. Um, a little bit more details on where we are with the mission and the instruments. Uh, the instruments have been built and integrated over the last few years. You see a picture here of the final testing of the two satellites. They're kind of stacked already in their launch configuration. This particular image here, they're undergoing uh, uh, acoustic testing to make sure everything is built to specs. And, and I, I can comfortably tell you that that is the case. We're very happy with uh, the outcome and, and the uh, testing results so far. On the ground, uh, you see here, uh, our engineering team with their colleagues from uh, Airbus in Germany where these satellites have been built. And just to uh, see, to show you here what's, what's under the hood, so I've, here they have the panels removed, the satellites are tilted to the side. You can see uh, very densely packed spacecraft, heavily instrumented. Uh, the engineers did a wonderful job in integrating all these components on the satellite. And because it's so dense and you don't really see much, uh, I have a little animation that just highlights one of the, a uh, couple of the key instruments that enable our uh, uh, observation capability. First, uh, we'll highlight this microwave interferometer that's at the front of the satellite here in red. This new technology demonstration, the LRI highlighted here, you see it takes up quite a bit of space. And then we have uh, a few other instruments, the accelerometer, the star cameras, and a GPS antenna to uh, enable precision orbit determination. And uh, all those observations together then enable us to uh, track total water storage changes globally. Um, you might have seen me checking my phone here a couple of times. I wasn't checking my emails. I was uh, looking at the flight tracker because the plane is actually about to touch down in Southern California. They're about 10 miles from uh, LAX. So uh, about 24 hours ago, you see the picture in the upper left. This is in Munich. The planes were uh, loaded onto a cargo plane and are being flown to uh, uh, Southern California as, as we speak. And uh, so uh, once they've touched down, they'll be transported up to Vandenberg Air Force Base um, near Santa Barbara. And then uh, our engineers, in conjunction with the Airbus engineers, will spend the next few uh, weeks or months getting ready for launch. Launch is currently planned for spring. 2018 on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Um, and also as a, a novel element here, uh, we're sharing the launch, NASA is sharing the launch with the uh, uh, Iridium company, so we'll, we'll launch together. Um, and uh, then we have a sort of two to three month uh, period where we uh, turn on all the instruments and uh, you know do some um, calibrations. And then we're ready to continue that uh, very successful data record that, that uh, Grace has provided us. And so in about uh, uh, six, seven months, we should be ready to, to release the first new map of uh, surface mass changes from Grace follow-on. Uh, if you want to know more about these missions, background material, status updates, uh, we have provided uh, two links here for you. Uh, we're very excited about these missions. Uh, 
I think the great thing is also that these are going to fly together concurrently, and it's really the combination of these multiple observations, these multiple angles that we have on, on the ice sheets, on our water cycle, that will enable us to, to track uh, the, the health, the status of Earth's ice, maybe floating or on ice sheets, and the Earth's water cycle as it evolves and uh, quite dramatically changes uh, in, in these uh, decades. So thank you. Okay, with that, we'll open it up for, to questions from reporters in the room. I'm Alex Witzi with Nature. I have two questions about Grace follow-on. One, um, what are the batteries like? How long are they gonna last? And two, if you could talk about kind of bridging the gap that there exists now between the end of the first Grace and the follow-on mission, how do you ensure sort of data continuity and integrity across that? Yeah, uh, excellent question. So uh, your first question was about the batteries. Uh, just for background, for those who don't know, uh, Grace seized operations um, partly due to, to weak batteries um, that proved to be a little bit at the end of its very successful life, uh, uh, an Achilles heel, um, but you have to consider the original mission lifetime is five years, so we, we outlived that by a factor of uh, three, very successful. For Grace follow-on, we have upgraded batteries um, while the uh, focus was, the emphasis was on continuity and employee similar technology, all components on the satellite have been upgraded. So we have the same core principle, measurement principle and, and uh, instrument components, but they have all been upgraded. We have more star cameras, uh, three instead of two. <laughs> um, we have a, a, a very sensitive accelerometer at the heart of the satellite, satellite which has also been upgraded. So everything has been upgraded, and uh, the, the original um, uh, baseline mission lifetime for GRACE follow-on is five years again, but uh, we're very confident that we could easily reach uh, 10, 15 years. There's a bunch of other factors that uh, affect the orbit um, or, or the mission lifetime, such as solar radiation. So those are factors that are out of our control. Um, your other question was about the continuity. So because GRACE ceased operations in June this year, we will have about a one-year gap, but um, we have a GRACE and GRACE follow-on science team in place where we are currently looking at um, assessing the continuity of, of the data uh, as, we, as the new GRACE follow-on uh, data comes online. Um, Contrary to, for example, uh, satellite altimeters, where it's quite critical that you have overlap because of calibrations of the instruments, the, the unique measurement concept of GRACE and GRACE follow-on in principle does not require mission overlap. But of course, uh, as we've seen, a lot of things can happen in a year, right? Aquifers can change. Um, uh, we, we are looking at at that continuity, also with uh, supplementing with other data types. So we can use satellite altimeters, uh, ocean buoys. We have uh, processes in place to ensure that continuity. Hi, uh, Jonathan Amos, uh, BBC. Um, yeah, a couple of questions here, maybe, maybe um, uh, pick up on that last point about um, cross calibration. Uh, Europe obviously is coming to the end of its, hopefully not too soon, uh, cryospheric mission Cryosat, which has been measuring um, to topography in uh, polar regions. Um, so plans there to um, do a joint campaign to uh, to make sure that once Cryosat is gone, you're continuing um, its measurements uh, as well. And also, in relation to running a laser in space, um, ISAT-1 famously only, I think, only used to work a couple of times a year, didn't it, because of uh, concerns about um, popping out the diodes. So how, how confident are we that the laser system on this satellite is going to work? Uh, um, <laughs> when it comes to lasers, yeah, uh, it's a good point. And, and so the concept of, of the laser is, you know, it's, there's, because we have a micropulse laser, the stress on the laser itself and on the diodes is much less than it was on ISAT-1. Um, ISAT and as, as, as a matter of fact, 
one laser should last the entire lifetime. And because of the concerns, we have, you know, diodes running for, you know, six, seven, eight years now in the lab to make sure, you know, the micropulse laser will work and, and, and last. So, you know, I'm really not so concerned about the diodes because of the concept. And, you know, what, as I said, one laser should, you know, last for the entire mission and we have, you know, two lasers on board. So we have one redundant laser, which we could use, uh, hopefully, you know, to extend its lifetime. Um, bridging the gap, cryosite is critical, so is ice bridge, you know, so um, and we're talking with ESA right now to adjust um, the cryosite 2 orbit to be match uh, ISAT 2s to get actually, you know, better coincidence between cryosite 2 and uh, ISAT 2 measurements because, you know, also ESA realizes, realizes how valuable a combination of cryosite with ISAT is. And, if you want to add something, Helen. No, I was going to mention that too. We had a, quite a lot of conversation at the meeting um, earlier this year, an ESA meeting for Cryosat. There was a, a long conversation about working together with the two agencies to, to fly in the same orbit, and there's a lot of um, support for that because the radar laser bias issues can be looked at in very, um, very good detail if we fly in the same ground track. So. It's really can, great. Can Hopefully, Cryosat 2 will still be operating when ISAT 2 launches. Yeah. Can you, can you just talk to the differences that you actually see? So, I mean, Cryosat is a KU band altimeter. You're a, a laser. Um, I think Sentinel 9, which will be the follow on, hopefully, to Cryosat, will be a KU KA yeah. band altimeter. So, and all of them see a different reflection surface. You don't see the same things, do you? Is that right? That's right. So uh, the KU band altimeter, as you know, um, penetrates into the snow surface, the upper layers of the, of the snow. Depending on the density of the snow, it's going to penetrate to a different, different depth. That's the bit we really don't know. We have to model it. Um, so if we have radar laser simultaneously, then we can really understand how that difference is changing. We do have some studies that connect the two. Um, we, in certain areas of the ice sheet, we've been able to quantify it. Um, but until we have simultaneous radar and laser on the same platform, or two satellites flying in the same ground tracks, it's going to be hard to quantify it over the entire ice sheet. Hi, um, Robert McSweeney from Carbon Brief. Um, I just wanted to ask about how the satellites are funded. Um, it's been quite well documented that um, NSIDC has been struggling to get um, a new satellite launch to continue its sea ice record. Um, I just wondered how NASA has managed to get two. So, NSIDC, you said? So, so NSIDC is not launching anything. NSIDC is a National Snow and Ice Data Center. So, um, ISAT-2 is funded through NASA. It's, you know, appropriated by Congress. And, and we just send the data to the National Snow and Ice Data Center for public distribution of the data. You know, as you know, you know, um, it is NASA's policy to make all, all of our data publicly available at no cost. So NSIDC's role is solely to distribute the data uh, to the public. But you are mm. correct that there is going to be a gap in the microwave, passive microwave record. There's actually a session on that. We may have missed it already, um, but you could look it up. It's Stan Wilson is leading that because um, it's something that we know about. Um. Uh, Rolf, it's Dutch Nair, Radio 1. F on the GRACE follow-up, um, with a laser instead of the old uh, distance um, instrument, you said that you would have a tenfold increase in the distance between the satellite. But what would that mean for the, um, uh, sort of the English? Oh, yeah, the resolution on the ground for like aquifer monitoring. Yes, that, that's correct. Oh, this one? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so the laser will afford us a much higher precision in the ranging measurement between the satellites by the factor of 10 to 20. Um, so it's a technology demonstration um, uh, uh, component on the satellites. Um, the way the configuration is right now, you will not see that same factor 
uh, propagate down, you will, we will not, with, with this particular configuration, get a tenfold increase in the re resolution on the ground. We will, however, be able to get a much more uh, a much better signal to noise ratio. So we will uh, reduce errors in the data field. And if this technology demonstration works, it's going to be the baseline for future gravity missions that we're already looking at. And then we combine that with other technology improvements and we can really utilize fully that tenfold increase in the uh, range measurement. Great. And then uh, as a Hello? Oh. Then as a follow-up question, um, for the calibration for, for GRACE or at least verification against ground measurements, do you team up with the physicists that do LIGO and other stuff, because I could see that their measurements of gravity deviation, albeit on a very different time scale, but basically their noise is your signal, isn't it? Uh, to, to some degree, yes. Um, I think those uh, experiments are measuring gravitational waves you know, and then for astrophysics, so that's a, a different application. Um, for GRACE or GRACE follow-on, um, our Ground truthing isn't really possible because it's the gravity field. However, we have ways to um, verify the data that we measure on orbit because we sense the gravity field up in, uh, at altitude where the satellites are. So um, we have in situ measurements such as uh, um, sea level, large lake level changes, um, over deserts where you don't really expect a big mass change because it's very dry, there is no, uh, you know, the, the, the gravity field doesn't, doesn't change. Um, so, so we have ways to uh, verify our measurements and, and ground truth it in, the, in that way, somewhat indirect, but um, a lot of work is going on in the GRACE science team to, to uh, make sure that the GRACE data and GRACE fall-on data are consistent with, with other me measurements. And maybe Don wants to add something on that because you've, you've done some work along those lines. The, the only other thing that I would add is that, you know, what really limits the resolution of the uh, gravity fields that we can get from GRACE, not the accuracy, the resolution, the spatial resolution, is the altitude of the, of the satellites. Uh, it's, it's, it, if we could bring them lower, we could get a finer resolution, but that's a trade-off for a longer lifetime mission. Yeah, there was a, a session this morning just briefly uh, looking at future uh, gravity missions. So we have various ideas on how to improve the, the uh, accuracy by flying constellations, for example, or lowering the altitude. There's always a trade-off between, uh, you know, improving that and, and cost and, and uh, other technology challenges. Wow. And we're <laughs> in the dark again. <laughs> All right. Someone want to tell a ghost story really quick? Um, do we have any more questions? I kind of can't really yes. see, but I'm going to try to look. I think we're just about out of time anyway. I feel, I feel like a deer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. At um, night. And no questions on the chat? No? Okay. All right. Well, then.